And my primary job is as an ear surgeon. And so I treat a lot of people that have hearing disorders, but I also specialize in musicians and try to understand how it is that a musician not only hears something, but also produces something. And because of my long-standing interest in music and the fact that I've played improvisational music for my whole life, I'd always had this question of how does a musician you know, take a jazz saxophonist, John Coltrane, somebody like that who's just playing, playing off the top of his or her head for you know, amazing stretches of time and beautiful quality of music, I always thought to myself, well, how does, how does that person do that? And as I kind of switched my role in life from being a just consumer of music to somebody who was studying it and you know, so supposedly knew something about how the brain perceived it, I started to think, well, maybe we can address this question of how does somebody do that? About 10 years ago, when I was at the National Institutes of Health, I decided to undertake a study of jazz musicians that were improvising while in a functional MRI scanner. And that was kind of our first attempt to really look at how the brain produces creative art at the moment. And so through a long history of doing these, these projects, which um, have been great in terms of interest level and collaboration with artists, I started to feel like there was a bit of a ceiling that we were reaching in the field where we had raised a lot of interesting questions, but were not really at the level where the field was evolving beyond that. And so what I had hoped for is being part of the organizing group for this conference is that we would sort of select, almost kind of hand curate uh, 50 or so scientists and artists from around the world to get together to discuss this topic, not just to have a great conversation, but to figure out how to move forward. And there are a lot of challenges when you bring, a, bring together a diverse group of people like this. I think fundamentally, the beauty of it is that everybody has a different viewpoint that is really quite, quite different I and mean, substantially different. And this sort of diversity of opinions is great for energy. I mean, it's almost like a fuel source. But I think that it raises some obstacles in terms of common languages, assumptions, expectations, and also kind of a culture clash. Uh, you know, one thing is for sure, if you, if you look at a group of neuroscientists interacting and you look at a group of artists interacting, these two rooms of people are vastly different in the way they talk, the way they think, and the way they even communicate to one another. Um, I think things like emotion, uh, feelings, and energy, resonance, these kinds of concepts are much more likely to come up in the, in the conversation of the artists. In a group of scientists, things like experimental design, methodology, proof, hypothesis, these are the kind of the language of the scientists. And so getting these worlds to collide in a way that is not destructive but constructive, is, it's, a, it's a challenge. But I think that's, that's kind of where the excitement is also. People are generally excited about the idea of collaboration, but also that there's a fair amount of discomfort with how to get it done. And that, I think, is appropriate, meaning that for a true balanced collaboration to occur, which is what I think is necessary in this kind of field, neither partner in this collaboration should really dominate the other. Um, and so as much as it's the neuroscience of art, there's sort of a certain sense that it's also the art of neuroscience. And so we have to figure out, the scientists have to figure out how to deeply respect what an artist does and fold that into the science so that when the artist is reading about this paper or writing this paper or working on this collaboration, they don't feel like they've been sort of treated like a guinea pig in any way conceptually or in actuality. That actually what they're doing is they're taking their knowledge and their experience and they're contributing to how the science is being fashioned. That I think is a hard thing to actually accomplish well. And then also vice versa, I think that the neuroscientists have, I mean, they're the, they're the methodologists and the experimentalists who are used to obtaining data and being able to say something about it that's quantitative and sort of verifiable. And that's, a, again, a very different thing. And I think the artists have to respect that in order for a scientist to actually accomplish something, it has to get to that stage. There has to be a way to kind of make concrete these things that might be very abstract in reality. The biggest surprise for me this week is actually how well everybody has gotten along. Yeah, I was uh, somewhat apprehensive that there might be a lot more outright disagreements, controversies, or flat-out fights between these cultures colliding in a way that was kind of destructive. And I was worried that there might be some dominant, dominantly negative voices on either camp that kind of steered things towards this, you know, potentially harmful place. And actually, none of that has, has occurred. And in fact, it's been the opposite. I've really felt nothing but a lot of genuine support 
for this endeavor with a healthy amount of skepticism, which is completely appropriate because I have it myself.